I have not been room mic'd before. This is going to weird me out. Um, we good in the back? Everybody? Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, for those of you not familiar with the program, uh, this is the Atlanta Intermediate Ruby Group. Um, so this was a group that I tried to start, well, got started a while back. Been a little busy um, instructing at the Iron Yard of late. Thanks for all my students to coming out. Um, but yeah, so the, the goal for these talks is to hopefully, I mean, I think the Rails community in town does a really good job of getting people started, uh, you know, exposing you to like the Hartle Rails tutorial, um, giving you an intro to like, here's Ruby, here's why it's awesome, and here's why you should check in on it. Um, but what I felt like was missing was kind of more hands-on, code focus, maybe like you finish the tutorial, like what do you do next? So that's, that's the goal for this group, and I really, like, I, as much as possible, would love to hear feedback about what you guys found valuable, like what you want to hear more about. Um, I'll say some more about that towards the end here. But um, th this is a group for y'all. Please get involved. Uh, I would love to hear topic ideas if people want to present stuff themselves. Uh, last time Kylie gave a talk on uh, full text search with Postgres was really cool, and a video for that will be up sometime? Yes. Sometime. Soon. It will be the next video release. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and everyone, big thank to Thanks to Frank for videoing all of everything for forever. Uh, seriously, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll solicit some more contributions here in a bit. Um, so next meetup, we're still trying to schedule. And again, I, I do want to get some feedback on what people want to hear about. Aiming for something late October, sometime around the 22nd. Watch the meetup group for specific announcements there. Uh, there is some, some more stuff coming down the pipe. Okay. But today's talk is on graphs. I'll explain that subtitle here momentarily. Um, but yeah, this is kind of a general catch-all introduction to graphs. Uh, a bit about my background, like I, I'm a math guy by trade, um, so have just been interested in them as, as mathematical objects. I was a topologist, if people know what that is. If not, it's not important. Um, yeah, really not at all important. Um, but yeah, so today I'm going to talk a little bit of math. Be glad to take math questions, but ultimately I want to get y'all to looking at uh, Neo4j, which is a graph database, and kind of explore some situations where thinking of your data as a graph maybe is more natural or more convenient than the more traditional like relational SQL data, SQL data stores that you may be familiar with. Um, if at any point in time anyone has any questions or wants to share their experiences, please stop me and contribute. I know some of you guys have done some of the stuff that I haven't, um, so I would love to hear y'all's input too. But getting started, a graph, very broadly, is a collection of nodes. Um, can everybody see some TV somewhere? OK. Um, so yeah, it's a collection, just very abstractly, of nodes uh, or vertices. I'll try and say nodes, um, which I will draw as a dot. Uh, the nodes have edges or links joining them, which I will draw as a line. And it's really just kind of broadly anything you can represent that way. Uh, for most of our applications, we'll think of these as you know, specific things. Like maybe this node is a person. Um, maybe the edges have attributes or directions. You know, there, there may be some metadata associated with this graph. But very broadly, it's just kind of anything that you can think of that way. Uh, which, as you can imagine, pretty broad topic. Uh, most things can be thought of that way. Um, but I will kind of point out a couple examples. So thanks to Frank for this suggestion. Um, this is where graphs all got started. Uh, this guy named Euler. Incidentally, if you've seen Project Euler, it's Euler, not Euler, like you might think. You will endear yourself to mathematicians if you pronounce it correctly. Um, what nationality is that? Uh, Swiss, right? I believe. I hope so. <laughs> Going to be embarrassed if I got that wrong. Uh, no, Euler was awesome, and, and in fact, like, that's Euler that you can't see behind those words. Um, amazing mathematician, not going to get into that. Uh, but his basic insight, like, so this was a, this is the bridges of Konigsberg. Um, this was an area near where he lived, and it was kind of a famous, and there are two islands with some collections of bridges joining them, and it was this question of, you know, people will try and walk around and walk over every bridge exactly once and end up back where they started. So easy enough sort of thing. Um, you may have done something like this as a child where you were trying to draw some shape without picking up your pencil. So for some shapes, you can do that. 
like uh, if you have like a house, you can do not that. <laughs> but you can do that. Um, what was I trying to think? Oh no, that's another non-example. Anyways, so there are some shapes that you can't. Um, and, and this is one in particular that kind of started Euler thinking about this and thinking about representing things as graphs. So I think the, the key insight here is you know, forget the geometry. You don't care how long a bridge is. You don't care where these things are located. You only care about how things are connected. So rather than draw islands, I'm just going to draw some nodes. Like here is the landmass up top. Here is the landmass on the left. Here is the landmass on the right. Here is the landmass at the bottom. And here's how they're connected. There's two bridges here. There's two bridges here. There's one bridge here. There's one bridge here. There's one bridge here. So the essence of this problem is just those graphs and how those things are connected. Um, bonus exercise, if someone can prove to me that you can't trace that thing out without picking up your pencil uh, at the end of the lecture, I will be impressed. And so that's the only prize I have. Oh, or there's pizza. You get pizza. Lots of pizza. Lots of pizza. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, that, that is the core insight. Like it, it is, graphs are excellent tools for when you want to think about just connectivity, when that's the thing that's really important. Um, if you've ever seen like a metro subway map, like that is properly represented as a graph because you don't care about how long it is from one station to another. You're not walking. It's just like what follows what, what's connected to what. Um, so we will be looking at data that we can represent that way. Um, specifically, often we are interested in paths in the graph. This is one example. Um, a series of successive adjacent edges is a path. So a path in this graph might look something like here to here, and then to here, and then to here and back. Um, so that would be a, a path or a walk that takes you back to where you started. Uh, missed some edges and would have to miss some edges. Um, I'll throw some terms at you. These aren't ones that I'll refer back to, so they're not important to remember. But a path that hits every edge once is called an Eulerian path, for reasons that you probably can guess. Um, and a path that hits every vertex is called a Hamiltonian path. And mathematicians are interested in such things. And actually, like, if you've thought about or heard about like, the traveling salesman problem, like, it relates to some graph, graph theory topics there. Um, the, the title of the talk is a, a drunkard's walk, which is another popular name for a random walk. Um, and the idea there is just you have a graph and you will move randomly along the graph. And this again, like this is one of those things that mathematicians kind of amuse themselves with because it's fun to think about, but it found some rather surprising applications. There's kind of a lot of stuff like that in math. Um, the idea here is you want to think about a graph by just imagining yourself on some position on the graph and just moving randomly. Like maybe it's a really simple, it's a line, you start in the middle, and you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you go left, and if it's tails, you go right. So maybe you get two heads, and then a tails, and you can think about how you move around on that. Um, just throwing this out there as an example. Uh, if you do that on a one-dimensional line, you expect yourself to return back to the center at some point. If you do that on a two-dimensional graph, it's highly unlikely that as time goes on and on that you return back to your starting position. So those random walks kind of tell you something interesting about the shape of the graph that you're on based on the paths that you expect yourself to take. Um, and that's a really simple example, so that one maybe isn't so interesting. Um, I'll put this backdrop up here. Do you guys recognize that one? No. I'm assuming. Um, so yeah, you, you can ask these sorts of questions about successively more and more interesting graphs. Um, one that I looked at at one point in time is you can think of the Monopoly board as a graph. Um, you know, it's got 10 nodes to a side. You start off with go. You move along. I'm not going to draw out the whole thing. Um, but you can think about that as a graph. And you can think about playing Monopoly as moving around randomly on that graph. Like you, roll, you roll to see where you end up next. So starting from go, you're going to end up somewhere probably around seven squares down the row. But maybe you get doubles and you go farther. Maybe you hit community chest and get 
teleported to a railroad somewhere. I mean, there are, there are all, all these rules, but you can enumerate, like, if you start here, the likelihood that you're here next time is this percentage. Um, and so thinking about random walks can kind of get you to, as time goes on, where do you expect to end up? So this was, uh, I'm, I know my students know this already, because uh, I got excited and spilled the beans. But can anybody guess what the best return on investment for properties in Monopoly is? Like which, which set of properties is the most valuable? Yeah. Uh, that's not purple. Purple is right by Go. That's Baltic. But yeah, the, the ones that are a little past jail. Um, yeah, and you can like rigorously prove this by saying like, if the game goes long, here's where you expect to end up. Like, here's your full probability distribution walking over this graph. Um, can you kind of summarize why that's the most valuable set? Like, what, what makes those particularly good? I know you know, because I told you. <laughs> Calm down. Um, oh, all right, yeah. So that, yeah, that'd be a good thing to do. Thank you. Yes, please stop me with good questions like that. Okay, so square board, there are some relevant squares. You start at go, over here there's jail and just visiting. Um, up here you have free parking. And over here you have go to jail. So as you move around the board, the properties get more valuable and you get more money if somebody lands on them. Um, but they also cost more money. Uh, and as anyone who's ever like, gotten Park Place and then waited to land on Boardwalk can tell you, like, it's kind of unlikely to do that. So it turns out the square that you end up on the most is jail, essentially because there's two jail squares. And then a whole bunch of, like, if you roll three doubles in a row, you end up in jail. There's some community chance cards that send you to jail. So like, if you look at the distribution, like jail is the most likely square, but you're not getting any money off of jail. So then your distribution is highest somewhere around seven squares out from jail. So the properties there end up landed on the most, end up getting you the most money back. And you can do that as a like, full-on rigorous analysis of a random walk on that graph and you know, figure out your kind of optimal monopoly strategy. Um, be happy to show anyone that wants to see it the math afterwards. But I think that's a little far afield for this talk, unfortunately. It's good math, though. It's really good math. <laughs> I like math. Um, now, and again, like that, that may seem really contrived to you. But I think here's the key insight that, um, that I think makes this stuff really exciting. Um, you can think of the internet as a graph. right? The, the nodes are web pages. The links are links, like literal hyperlinks between pages. Um, and you can ask yourself, if you are a random surfer, and you start on a page, and you click a link at random, and you click a link at random, and you click a link at random, and you kind of look and see where are you likely to end up, well, the pages where you are most likely to end up are probably kind of core to the internet. Like, they are central important pages. Like, all paths lead to Wikipedia, probably. Um, and I mean, there's some variations you need to make there, because if you follow a path to a page that has no links on it, then you end up stuck there. So you have, to, you have to allow a little bit for like going back or like randomly starting over. But it really is essentially the same sort of analysis that leads you to Google's PageRank algorithm. Um, that it, it is, and it really is pretty much the same math at the heart of that to figure out you know, the most important pages on the internet are the ones that have you know, these links drawing people into them. And so if I am a search engine and want to rank pages, Really, it's not even the content of the pages. It's not all those hidden extra tags. It's you know, people linking to this tells me that it's important. And even moreover than that, it's, it's important people linking to this, where important is determined by important people linking to them. It's, it's recursively thinking through the structure of that graph that really tells you a lot of information. Um, so I mentioned that just to say like there are a wide spectrum of problems where I think these you know, admittedly kind of silly sounding graph approaches can lead to some really, really powerful data. Um, that's kind of the idea behind this stuff. So from here on out, I want to present what this might look like to you as you know, Ruby developers. Um, you know, how do you even start with playing around with graphs? 
Um, so I do want to present some more kind of hands-on code for the rest of the talk. Um, I will specifically be talking about Neo4j, uh, which is not to say that Neo4j is the best graph database out there. Like there are actually several of them. Um, they all do slightly different things better than the others. Uh, I do particularly like Neo4j um, for a couple reasons. One, it's got a really good REST API. Um, it seems to be well supported, and I think it, in my experience, it's one of the easiest ones just to get started and get up and running and start playing around with. Don't think this is the only thing you can ever use, um, but I do think if you're interested in this stuff and want to like, mess around on your own, it's a good place to get started. Um, so I'll show you a bit of what that looks like. Um, the idea with any graph database is, you know, rather than storing your data that your application uses in rows and tables, you're going to be storing them as nodes with attributes on the nodes and links with you know, some sort of metadata on the links, possibly. Um, and we will be querying them rather than saying, you know, give me the rows where this field is 10. Um, you know, we can talk about give me the nodes that are linked to nodes that are linked to nodes of this type, you know, things like that. Um, incidentally, Neo4j is written in Java. It'll run as a standalone program. Um, if you, I'm uh, sorry, I have been teaching at the Iron Yard and I have assumed that everyone has a Mac and I realize that's false and I apologize. Um, so sudo apt get instead of brew, like whatever you need to do. Um, but it should be pretty easy to get up and running. That, that is one of the nice things about it being a fairly widespread and, and well supported tool. Um, but yeah, package manager of your choice, install Neo4j if you don't like doing Java things directly. Um, and Neo4j start will start up a Neo4j server that you can interact with. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like here in a second. Um, in the Ruby world, you kind of have, have two different ways that you can then interact with that. Um, it's got a really nice REST API that you could hit either directly or using a gem like Neography that wraps that or active node that wraps that, and we'll see both of those here in a second. Um, if you really want to dig in and get into some of the more powerful features, you might want to interact with Neo4j a little more directly um, using something like JRuby. Uh, you have access to another gem, neo4j.rb, um, which I won't say anything else about, except to say that I wouldn't mind giving a talk on JRuby at some intermediate Ruby group in the future. But today, we're going to be talking about the REST API and Neography. Um, yeah, so the goals here, we're going to look at some code stuff. Um, just kind of see what Neo4j is capable of and, and you know, what a query looks like, what this is the syntax. Um, look at a Rails application that does talk about a graph but tries to do it in just straight SQL and kind of compare and contrast and, and explore some of those Rails side tools for talking to Neo4j. So that's where we're going. Um, so yeah, now we turn to some examples. Uh, you guys maybe can guess this one? Yeah, that's where we're headed. Okay, so I will say I have already installed Neo4j and have started a server running. Um, one of the really cool things that that gives you if you want to start poking around um, is you have this nice Neo4j web UI. It'll start up on your local host at port 7474 by default. Um, and I feel a little bad walking you through the tutorial, but like it's a really good tutorial. So we're going to step through some of that. Um, their little built-in example is playing around with a movie graph. Uh, so the way to read this is, this is your command line up top. You can type in queries. Um, you know, rather than using SQL, you use a language called Cypher. Um, so we will execute some queries there. They will run, manipulate our graph, and we'll kind of explore the results. Um, so this should, like, Create statements look pretty similar. Um, the thing to remember is we'll always be talking about nodes and links. So the way to read this is this whole thing is a node called the matrix with label movie. Nodes have types uh, or labels more specifically um, with the following metadata. Its title will be the matrix. It's released in 1999. Its tagline is welcome to the real world. Um, one really cool thing about graphs, and, and I think one of the really good use cases here is the nodes don't have to represent the same kinds of items. You know, if you have a table of data, every row is a similarly structured thing. 
no such requirement whatsoever with a graph database. So I will have nodes that are movies. I will have nodes that are people. Keanu is a person, Carrie is a person. Um, and I'm really interested in the relationships between them. So we'll, I will also create some edges, some links. Uh, and the way to read this is I am creating a link between Keanu and the matrix. Namely, Keanu acted in the matrix. And that relationship specifically gets tagged with, in that movie, his role was Neo. Um, and you, know, you can have different types of relationships. Like Andy W. directed the Matrix. Joel S. produced the Matrix. Uh, so there is a whole bunch of data here. I'm not going to look through all that, but you know, several movies you can kind of guess. So I will execute that query. It'll run. Uh, return to the matrix, so that's the movie. Um, I should mention at the end of that query there was one oops, return the matrix, so we saw that node. Uh, but anyway, so that is just, that, that has populated the database with a whole bunch of movies and actors and relationships between all of them. And the cool thing is then querying that. Yeah, so the, the graph results that we'll see are part of the built-in Neo4j web UI. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll see a lot more of that. So, uh, you know, much like in straight SQL, when you would write a select, uh, there's no notion of from, because it's just one big graph. But here it's your kind of pattern matching. So we'll match nodes where the name of that node is Tom Hanks, call it Tom, and return Tom. So I got one node back. That's Tom Hanks. He was born in 1956. Um, again, probably not terribly interesting. The ones that are cool are the ones that talk about relationships. So here I'm matching. I'm looking for a node of you know labeled person with name Tom Hanks, calling him Tom grabbing all of the nodes that are linked to him via an acted in relationship, calling them Tom Hanks movies, and returning both Tom and the Tom Hanks movies. So there we go. We get the subgraph of things that match that. Like I have Tom. I also have movies that he acted in. Apollo 13, Green Mile, Da Vinci Code. And notice I also have this one, that thing you do. The, here the UI is not great, and it's a little hard to see what's going on. There are two relationships between Tom and the green mom, or sorry, that thing you do. He both acted in and directed that one. So there's a little directed link there that's hard to see. But that's pulling in the, the subgraph around Tom Hanks. Um, and I should say, like the, the, that graph visualization is very specific to the web UI. But what that, I mean, that, that is making a query over the REST API just like you would yourself. And the data that that's actually returning looks something more like this. Tom is a node with attributes named Tom Hanks and born 1956. And the movies are the following uh, with all of their title and released and tagline attributes. Um, you can also nest relationships, or you know, have co-occurring relationships. And I think this is where the real power of these sorts of databases come in. This is starting to get rather hard to express in SQL. But here I'm saying, grab me, so M would be people, or M would be movies that Tom Hanks acted in. And I'm looking for other people related to that same movie via an acted in relationship. So that would be people that have acted in a movie that Tom Hanks has acted in. That makes sense? That's kind of the key concept here. Um, right, so this should be a list of all Tom Hanks' co-actors co along with the movie that they co-acted in. So let's see that. So there's the list of, oh, and I, I, I asked for it to return co-actors' names, so it's just a list of the results. This is not comprehensive, this is just from that data set that we put in. So anyways, back to the picture. Let's call Hollywood, oh, um, and the really powerful thing, and we'll see this momentarily when we try and emulate some of this was just with just SQL, 
is if you want to talk about things that are immediately related. Like you can do that in SQL with a join. That's not too bad. Um, what becomes really difficult is when you want to talk about friends of friends of friends of friends. Um, that can lead to some really gross SQL and some really painful queries. Uh, but because this is a graph, because it talks so naturally about paths, it becomes very easy to represent things like that. Um, so the idea with this query is we're going to start with a person whose name is Kevin Bacon, call him Bacon, find all paths. And again, like, I, I love this syntax. It's just you have parentheses around nodes, you have lines indicating arcs, and you just add whatever data you want around there. So you know, this represents a link between Kevin Bacon and other people. Um, and this star operator represents variable length paths. So this is saying, give me any person, any node that is connected to Kevin Bacon by a path of length between one and four. So this is all the movies he was in, all the people that were in those movies, all the movies they were in, out four steps. Uh, and there's the raw data result, but here's the graph. Um, so it's enough nodes that the UI is a little laggy, but fair enough. Uh, so yeah, like Frost Nixon is in this graph. Uh, Kevin Bacon acted in Frost Nixon, which was directed by Ron Howard, who also directed The Da Vinci Code, starring Audrey Tatao. Am I Tatao? How do you? Embarrassing. I've read that name. Um, anyway, so you know, you get the subgraph around Kevin Bacon. Again, a really easy one-line query. That would be gross to do in SQL. Um, and ultimately, there's that game, you know, given two people, how do you link them to Kevin Bacon? Or given one person, how do you link them to Kevin Bacon? Or two people, how do you link them in general? Um, because this is a graph database, there are lots of built-in tools for talking about paths and even shortest paths. So here you see just a built-in shortest path operator linking the person named Kevin Bacon by any path of any length to the person named Meg Ryan. So let's see that. Kevin Bacon was in A Few Good Men with Tom Cruise, who was in Top Gun with Meg Ryan. So yeah, that is broadly what a graph database is capable of. And, and something like, this, this is roughly what the, if you're writing raw cipher queries, the equivalent of writing raw SQL, that's roughly what the queries look like. New, well, so that's a little bit hard to specify because in theory the relationship could be between three or four or five movies and how, like, then if there's a length four with old movies and length three with new movies, which would you, like, it just, it becomes hard to say what you want there. I will, like, th there's a whole bunch more that I'm not showing you. Um, the, there is a little cheat sheet that it, I think a quick skim through this would give you some idea of what's possible. There are, you know, where queries, and you could say things like where the movies were after 1990. Like, you could filter out things that way. Um, okay, because you aren't really specifying that it's some particular type of path, it becomes a little bit harder to, to filter on intermediate nodes that way. Like, you are, you are giving up control over that. Um, but yeah, there, there are lots of extra operators that I'm not going to present. It is a fairly rich language. But I'll, I'll point you at the Neo4j docs for that one. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yeah, um, and if, like there are, you know, we are labeling the nodes for convenience here, but nothing even enforces that nodes of the same label have the same set of attributes. Like that, that, like in this example, all of the people had names and all of the movies had, you know, release dates and taglines, but you could have some movies that have something, some that have others. Um, yeah, this is totally schemaless. Internally, that's a good question. Um, I know, so it is, the only bit I've messed with much is you can build Lucene indices on particular, like if you want to say, like I am often going to be querying node, like person nodes by name, you can say like build an index on this field. 
And I know it, like you can specify when you run a query, use a particular index. Um, as far as the internals of how it's querying the graph, I, I don't know much about that one. It's a good question, but I, yeah. That, that I will admit, you know, I, I am presenting this as it, it is very expressive, but I have found one of my points of frustration with this stuff has been it's often hard to tell how it's gonna perform a query. Like I've got pretty good intuition for if I run a SQL query, like this will use an index and this will be fast, whereas this will be a table scan and this will be slow. I have no such intuition for this. And that might be a failing on my part, but it, it does, it is pretty arcane for, for a lot of those. Just a fair point. Um, commercially, yes, Insight Pool, who incidentally sponsored our pizza. Um, yes, thank you, thank them. Uh, yeah, so they had, I don't know if they still, I think they're on like Titan at this point, but it, at one point they had a like 80 gig Neo4j instance that they were running. So they could probably tell you a lot more about scaling that one out than I could, uh, and I would ask them questions. Um, but yeah, as far as like prominent open source ones, I don't have a good reference off the top of my head. Although I will like, the Neo4j folks do a good job about like putting out documentation and also putting out blog posts about like use cases. And I guarantee you they have a rundown of like who's using Neo4j. I don't, I probably should have looked at that before this, but didn't. Um, so yeah, I, I would refer you to their blog. I'm sure they have some write-ups there. Um, I have used this for a you know, fairly small toy project, not toy project, but it, it's, a, it's a, a database of math stuff. Um, it's facts with derivations, so facts depend on other facts that you've assumed that depend on other facts that you've assumed. And it was exactly this, like, I wanna find things that depend on things that depend on things that depend on things, that, and, and maybe that goes all the way back. Like, I have these very long length paths. And that was just really painful to do in SQL and you know, pretty straightforward to do here. Um, so I have used it for that sort of thing. Ultimately, like that, that still was a small project, so scaling it out performance, not a huge concern on that one. Yeah, any other questions? Cool, okay, let's see some Ruby. Um, yeah, uh, I will clean up after myself. Uh, this is, I am matching all of the people nodes and movie nodes, optionally matching any relationship off of people and movie nodes and deleting all of them. So just throwing those away. So good, those should be gone. All right, so yeah, some Ruby stuff would be good. Uh, so I will say, like, I have made and pushed up a repo here um, that is available, and I'll have links up to this if you want to you know, review any of this later. Um, but a couple examples that I wanted to work through. Um, one, I think, like, the, the first place that a lot of people run into this sort of thing is, is some sort of social app. You have your users, and they have friends, and you want to know things like, what friends do I have in common? Like, who, who are my friends two and three leaps out? Um, and w without presuming to speak for insightful people, like that is kind of, they do analysis on like Twitter networks to figure out who are important people to target, um, you know, who, who are key influencers there. So like what are the central nodes in that graph and who can I talk to directly to kind of expand my reach that way. So uh, it's a natural tool for those sort of things. Um, I think, you know, if you are talking about a social application, a reasonable tool to consider. Um, so the first example I want to look at here is I have roughed up this app. Really, really simple data model. Ignore this gem data, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, I have users, they have names, they also have nodes because I will be storing them in Neo4j and I want some link between the two. Um, and I just have some link between users. So I'll have, and Frank, I said I wasn't gonna draw anymore and then I'm drawing, sorry. Uh, but you know, if I have users, here's James, and here's Robert. I will represent that they are friends by, I mean, conceptually I'm thinking of that, but if I want to represent that in a like, relational database as SQL, um, I'm calling these users, and I'm calling this link a friendship that has a from ID and a to ID. Um, yeah, so I built out a little rake task that you can read, it does some math, probably not instructive to read that. Um, the idea here is to build a random but representative graph that looks like a Twitter network. That's actually kind of an interesting problem in its own right, is building 
Like you want it to be kind of random, but you don't want it to be totally random because like the Twitter graph isn't totally random. Like there are high degree nodes and there are low degree nodes. Yeah, you look like you have a thought. Huh? Uh, yeah, small world networks usually are, but it's not like a near or any random thing. Uh, do, is there like a question or assertion latent in that? No. No, it's it, so it is. It is a really neat question. Um, it like how do you how do you make a small graph that looks and behaves like a Twitter graph? And I get maybe you're saying like you can grab like any random subsample of the Twitter graph ought to kind of look like the whole Twitter graph if it's scale invariant. <laughs> maybe it's possible. Um, so th this is actually like what this is doing is it generates. I'll I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader to follow through, but it, it so say you have six people. Um, the idea is you will start by linking maybe each of your neighbors together. So it generates some sort of regular pattern. And maybe like if you have more people, you know, maybe you are linked to the four people around you. Um, so not necessarily connecting everyone, but some sort of regular structure. That's what this first bit is doing. Um, and then randomly rewiring some. So some people pick up more friends, some people don't. So this graph should have some like, for any particular node, it should have some collection of friends. Like people have a relatively uniform number of friends. But then I do have some like jumps all the way across. I do have some like connections from you know across the way. Um, so this is actually the Watts Strogatz model of a random graph. Just throwing math at you. Sorry. Um, anyway, so this is a random graph that should be somewhat representative of a Twitter network. Point of all that is once we get this created, we will create some friendships, save the graph record, um, and, and have a graph that we can query. So let's look at, so I, I have built a graph. I'll fire up a Rails console and we can poke around with this. Um, so let me grab a user. Uh, yeah. So I've got a user record, standard active record, just basic Rails thing. Um, I'm going to grab a user model for the node that represents me. Oh, sorry. And look at my friends. Uh, I faker named these. I don't actually have friends named Wilfred Bond 2, <laughs> unfortunately. That'd be cool. I'd hang out with that guy. Um, so yeah, let, let's take a look at how we're doing that. I, I mean, any thoughts here? Like, if if I have this friendship model, what does it mean? Like, so you know, my node. You know, if I'm ID three, then in a relational database, who are my friends? Are you just using the active node for other things that are on the graph? No, this is just this is a SQL. This is an active record base. I have a table that's users that has a name, and I have this friendship model representing like. Uh, I guess I haven't talked about directedness, and I don't really care about the directions. I made some in both directions. Um, but yeah, so the idea here, like th th this friendship record being in the friendship table, and so if there's a friendship from three to five, that indicates that I am friends with user ID five. So the set of all of my friends would be, you know, you look at users joined with friendships where from ID was three. I guess, or two ID was three, but I don't, I don't want to worry about directedness. Um, and in fact, I, in that rake task that built the graph, whenever I added a friendship, I added the reverse direction so that I wouldn't have to worry about which one was from and which one was two. There's one, there's a reverse of every node that's in the graph, or every artist that's in the graph, rather. Um, so I've got a really quick little helper here. I really just want to look at the SQL that I'm writing to get this. So wrote a helper method to run a query. But my friends would be, take the users, join on friendships where the two ID of the friendship is me. Or sorry, where like I'm interested in users where their ID is the two ID of the friendship and the from ID of the friendship is my personal ID. Does that make sense? Um, how would I get friends of friends? Just do the same thing, but reset each of the steps yourself. 
Uh, yeah, like without having to drop into the Ruby layer and loop over IDs or do an n plus one query or something. I can't, like I, I'm trying to do this in straight SQL. More joins. Friends of friends. Can you guys see that all right? Can I make that bigger? Um, yeah, so friends of friends would be, okay, maybe this is easy to start from the bottom. Like I'm gonna join on friendships twice. I'm gonna start with like the friendship number two, like the second friendship join. I look at where it's coming from my ID. And then I'm gonna join that with friendships one. So the, the set of two IDs on those friendships would be my friends. But then I'm gonna join those friendships with another set of friendships where the two ID on those friendships is the from ID on the other friendships, and then look at the two IDs on those friendships. So conceptually, that, that makes sense. Um, as you can imagine, this doesn't perform wonderfully. This is a small enough data set that it's not a huge deal. Um, but so friends.count would be six. Friends of friends dot count would be 24, and there you see the, the SQL that it's executing. Um, how about friends of friends of friends? Yeah. Uh, oh, here, I, yeah, I have my order wrong, sorry. Slightly different thing here. Um, if I have me and I have you and I wanna find out what friends we have in common, another natural sort of question. Um, it's still, it's, I mean, it's the same, the same kind of idea, like each join is essentially another step in the path. So if I'm interested in people that fall in the middle here, then I wanna look for some link joining these two. So that would be a link, a friendship from me to this person who has a friendship from them to you. Uh, the only thing that's really different there is how am I gluing those links together which in this world means how am I joining the tables together? Um, so yeah, where, yes. I can't even read this and I wrote it. Right, so friendship one to ID is a user ID. Friendship two from ID is a user ID where the to and from ID on the outsides are my ID and your ID respectively. Are you guys grossed out by this? Good. Not really, okay. Fair. Um, no, really, I, I mean, the, the, like this is a pain point that is the main point that I'm trying to get across. If you wanted to go three steps out, you're joining a lot, um, and really, like, you could conceivably want to write a function where you go an arbitrary, like you take n and you find friends that are n steps out, and I don't even know how you write that in SQL. Like that would be really hard to do. So if you ask, like, here are two nodes, like the, the Meg Ryan to Kevin Bacon example, if you wanted to say how far apart are they, I don't think you have anything sensible to do except you know, start from Kevin Bacon, check out his friends, is Meg Ryan in there? Check out their friends, is Meg Ryan in there? Check out their friends, is Meg Ryan in there? Until you hit it or give up. Um, so I wrote a thing to do that. And that was the best I could do. Um, yeah, it's pretty gross. Uh, so I think like, if you get nothing else out of this, if you find yourself writing logic that looks like this, stop, evaluate your tooling, and choose something more appropriate. Um, so yeah, let, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison. Here's those users modeled as an active record. Let's take a look at the users modeled as a node. Um, and here I'm using, uh, to an earlier question, I'm using active node base, which is I think a relatively recent gem. The goal of which is, so uh, you know, we are, we are making these RESTful API queries to Neo4j, um, just like you know, with SQL, we're making some queries to database. This tries to hide that from you and give you as close to an active record looking syntax as it can. Like there are some differences, it's not perfect, and it's a relatively new gem that still like, needs some work about fleshing out the API. But it does give you a pretty close experience. Um, I will say I implemented a, so like I have my user record, which I'll call record. Um, U.node should look up the node object. And my nodes have the same set of methods. So uh, U.node.friends is now the nodes that are my friends, but similarly I can get a count. 
I could get a count of friends of friends. So those match, those are consistent, should be getting like the same data. Um, but here's what that looks like implemented with something like Neo4j. Um, same thing, I'm just setting up some helpers. Now when I run a query, it's gonna be using the active node find by cipher method. But I won't worry too much about that. Um, here's friends of friends. Uh, I start off with the node with ID, the ID that I'm passing in. Um, this is some syntax, like just like raw SQL queries have the question mark to escape. Um, these brackets are how you pass in an ID safely here. Um, so I start off with the node with my ID. I match things with the following pattern. It's a node that's myself with a link to a node that I don't care about with a link to a node that I'll call A and return all of those A's. So that would be all of the friends of friends. And I, like, I, I really do, performance, anything aside, um, this feels a lot better to me because you can read that. I mean, there, there's a bit of learning to do about how Neo4j expresses it, but it, it's very instructive. Like, there's a node, there's some lines to a node, there's some lines to a node, and that's exactly what it's grabbing. It's a cute little query language, yeah. Sure, yeah, so if like, if your links, so the edges that I've generated here don't have types, but we saw that in the movie database um, where you had you know, directed by, was in. If your edges have relationships, you can tag them and say, like I'm only interested in relationships of type friends. So friend or friend with or whatever you called it, but only give me edges, you know, links that link together, things with that, that type on the link. And I mean, you could even find enemies of friends if you had tagged your links with those classes. I don't know that that would make any sense. Um, so I won't do that so much, but yeah, and, and we'll see that again in, in my other example that I wanna present, that I do have some, some types on, on the links. Um, the nice thing is though, if I wanna scale this out, it actually scales really nicely. Um, same deal if I wanna do friends in common with another, I just, I wanna talk about those two nodes, so I'll start off with the node with my ID and the node with the other ID, and just draw a picture of what I want. I want nodes that fall between myself and the other. Oh, except, I didn't test that, because that was wrong. Um, but yeah, so like, call the one node self, call the other node O, and just things that fall in the middle of that, and give me all the distinct values back. Pretty self-explanatory, I think. Um, Friends of friends of friends, same deal. Uh, I want you know, nodes that are linked together by a path of length three. And I think you see then, like, if I wanna find nodes linked together by a path of length n, I can pass in n, put that n there, and be done with it. Like, it is no harder to scale that out. So if you find yourself writing like, lots of nested self-joins, better way. Um, Similarly, like one of the things that's really hard to do, if you're finding the shortest path from one node to another in a SQL representation, you have to, like as you're adding in edges, you have to keep track of all of that, and then when you finally find the person, you return back the path. Like that's a ton of bookkeeping to keep up with. Um, here, it is no harder. It's just rather than you know, find a, a node at the end of the path, find the shortest path and return it, and you're done. Um, I, so, Maybe I'll, I'll throw a pry in the middle here just to inspect this for a second. Um, I do just, I did add some helper functions here. Uh, let's let A and B be the two least popular people in our graph. Oh good, thank you Neo4j. Um, so I have A, I have B. I can do A, um, oh and I should say like, this is a user node. It doesn't give you quite like the same rich representation that you get from an active record object. You can't do the user. Uh oh. Sorry, stand by one.
<laughs> Hello. Is that all right? All right, I'm going this way. It's the weirdest presentation I've ever given. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so we have this active node object. We do have some accessors on it. Like I can get the attributes from that node. Am I good now? Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Um, okay, so I can get attributes on that node. Like these nodes have names. I can look those up. Um, and in fact, my, my helper that I wrote here to get the shortest path from A to B um, should return that. Oh, come on. Live demos. Um, so yeah, the, the result that that's getting back from the, the Neo4j RESTful API looks something like this. If you're making those REST queries yourself, you'll get something like this. Uh, and I'm just gonna pull from that, like this is a path, the list of nodes that show up here. I'm gonna grab their IDs and look up those nodes. This is what a, a path looks like though to the Neo4j endpoint as it returns it. Um, but this is just you know, pulling out the nodes, grabbing the IDs and looking them up. Um, all right, yeah, good. So let's reload all that. So two nodes, shortest path between them, gives you a list of people with you know, relatively easy just looking up the name attribute on those nodes. Um, and just to show you briefly that, that, that problem at the end of the active record where if I wanted to trace out all of the nodes around a person, you know, the Hollywood graph around Kevin Bacon, becomes really easy to write still because it's just, it's all people at the end of a path of length zero to whatever depth you want to get. So much more natural to express this way. Um, all right, that's pretty much the first example. Any questions on that one? Oh, okay, yeah, so that's a fair question. So um, in this example, I do, like I am kind of mingling the data stores, um, and I do kind of tend to prefer to do that. Like Neo4j is great for what it does, but it does, like, I, I, my experience with it was a little lacking is, like, if you want, there's, there's only the one Neo4j database. So like they're backing up and trying a new database is you just like move the database folder somewhere else was the best solution I saw to that, which seems weird. Um, so I do tend to like to think of like a SQL database as my primary data store, and then just have something that says, now dump all of this stuff out to Neo4j um, so that I can query it there. Um, I have not used, I have not like written a Rails app where the only thing that we stored data in was Neo4j. You can do that, and you can just throw away ActiveRecord entirely, and you write all of your Neo4j stuff by just doing creates on your Neo4j nodes. Um, but if you're going with that sort of strategy where, like, where you have active record things and you just want to populate your Neo4j database, Here's, here's how I did that in the user example. Um, so I, oh yeah, I wrote a rake task to export the SQL data into Neo4j. Um, so no, I mean th this, is it stand this is a standalone rake task, so this one is available as um, rake users export. So it would have to explicitly do that, but then what that does is it's all right here. It grabs all of the user records. Those are the active record user objects um, that do not have a node ID attached. Creates a node using the, that active node syntax, named the same thing as the corresponding record, and then marks the record so that the record knows that its node is that particular node that got created. Um, so if at any point in time I have a, a user record, I can just go, now give me their node in the database and give me the friends around that and, and query that out easily. Um, I've found that to be pretty convenient when I'm using like both data stores. Um, yeah, and then it just goes through and like looks at each user record, grab, so this is a little hard to follow. So rec is a record, rec.friends is the friends as the SQL side understands it. So it will grab all of the nodes corresponding to those friends and then save that as the friends of the node. So rec.node is an active node, and its friends is managed by active node, and so that's the thing that actually creates all of the friend links. Because in the active node side, I have 
Um, no. On the active node side, I have a has many friends, which gives me this node.friends setter. So, that, I mean, that's pretty, like, it, it's not perfect. Like, I think if you're coming from Active Record, you'd expect to be able to do, like, rec.nodes.friends, shovel operator, and push in a node and that work, and that doesn't work. It looks like it works, and then it lies to you. Lesson learned. Um, so, you know, be careful that 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 gem is new and coming along, but, uh, you know, has some pitfalls, so watch out for that. But it does, it is aiming for a, as close to an Active Record experience as you can get. Like, this very much hides the fact that you're working on Neo for j and you totally can forget that if you're not paying attention, which, good thing you're not, I don't know. Yeah? Yeah, so if you have um, a list of users, and that's like kind of like the system you're thinking, and you have this security manager, would you still write it to put all of the information in the system you think? Or you think like, so if you have uh, users that have a whole lot of apps, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a fair point. So, like, if you, it's, I mean, it seems like you want to go the whole way or not at all. Like, you either want to only store in Neo4j the connection information, and then when you get your list, of like, here are the IDs of my friends, then you go back to SQL and pull them out. Like, your SQL is your one source of truth, and it's just there for convenience of querying. Okay. That's that's how I've usually approached it. Um, that's certain, like, in the the you know, proof database thing, like, that was the approach. It was just, like, this depends on this. For any specifics about what a proof was, SQL is the thing to trust. Um, that may just be me being a little bit gun shy about this. Um, I, I'm not saying that you can't use Neo4j as a primary store, keep everything in there, serve all the results straight out of it. That that should work fine. Um, to some extent, that's just me being more comfortable with the SQL side and the tooling around that, and the backups and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to treat like a Neo4j the same way I would an Elasticsearch or any sort of external extra searching tool. Um, just, you don't have to, but that's that's how I've mostly used it. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it does, um, and I, I've used a few of those. I really like. In this talk, as much as anything, I wanted to kind of expose you to the cyber query language. But yeah, the that um, active node does provide some of those. And I've used a few of them. Like, there is a where method that does more or less what you'd expect. There was not a first or create method, so I had to make one. Um, but there is a where, there is a create. Like, a lot of those basic things that you would expect out of active record are available on an active node, similarly. Uh, Neo4j? So, I mean, it, it is a REST API, so any language that can make HTTP queries, good to go. Uh, as far as, like, embedded, like, lower level things, I'm not sure about anything except JRuby, and I only know a little bit about JRuby. Um, so, yeah, but the, 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 the REST API is quite nice. And that, let me, so let me go ahead and, and get to the next example. Um, well, it doesn't do that much more. Um, but the next, so in this example, I am just using the raw Neo4j interface. Um, although, I'm just a little bit. Uh, all right, let me set this up a bit. Um, for this last example, the, the graph that I wanted to look at that I was kind of interested in exploring was the uh, thinking about the Ruby Gems ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, that last example was a little uninteresting in that all of the nodes were the same thing, they're all users and all of the relationships were symmetric and everything. Um, but here, I want to think about the RubyGems ecosystem. So maybe we have uh, active record is a gem. Active record depends on uh, JSON, probably. No, I don't know. Something that active record depends on. Um, so we have depends on relationships. There are also some dev depends on relationships, because I had those and it was convenient. I don't care all that much. Um, but also have author nodes. So DHH wrote active record, which depends on JSON. Um, and I think that, that really is one of the big use cases and, and, and one of the places where I, I find this really convenient. Uh, 
your graph, like your graph nodes can be anything. They don't all have to be the same type. The relationships can all be varied and different, and you can talk about that heterogeneous collection pretty easily. Um, so I did, like, I, I actually, like, there's a rake task in here, and you can take a look at it. Um, so gems.rake, I scraped the entirety of RubyGems. Um, so if anyone else wants to do that, just let me know, and I'll give you the data, because that took, like, a day. Um, so don't, don't do that yourselves. That's hogging up their bandwidth. Um, so yeah, scraped it in, and, and it's the same sort of pattern that I usually do there of, I'm saving them into a gem data record. Um, and the gem data model itself, not terribly sophisticated. It has a spec column that it serializes as JSON. So I'm just saving the whole gem spec. And it's, is everybody familiar with gem specs? I probably should back that up a tad. Um, so Ruby gems, I'm assuming everyone has installed a Ruby gem. Uh, Ruby gems have dependencies, and the gem spec lists a lot of like metadata about a gem, including the other gems that it depends on. So here's, let me say, G is gem, find by name, active record. So here's what a gem looks like as far as I'm concerned. The interesting part is the spec. So the gem spec will have information like this. Um, version, number of downloads, name, authors, and the dependency is really the interesting part. So this gem depends on, at runtime, active model, active support, and ARL. So it's got all of that data in there. Um, and from there, build out, so I'm going to populate Neo4j directly, um, delete any existing gems and authors just to clear things out. Uh, this, I mentioned that indexing just to make queries a little bit more performant. I will create an index on gem names and authors. That's what that would look like. Um, and then go through all of the gems, like find each one in turn, look at the spec, and do a batched execute query. Um, I'll look at that in just one second. But first merge, which a merge is like, it's an upsert, it's a create unless it already exists. It's a first to create. Um, so this will create a gem named the name of the gem. Then look at the authors from the spec. For each one, make an author named the appropriate thing. Um, and then run through all the dependencies, make uh, links of type depends on all of the dependencies, make links of type dev depends on all of the development dependencies, and make links of type wrote on all of the author to the gem that they wrote relationships. So all of that data should be available in Neo4j after runs. Um, the batch thing is just like there are something like 80,000, I guess I can tell you exactly. Um, as of the time of my scraping, there were 88,046 Ruby gems. Um, and as you can imagine, all of the various dependencies, like that ended up being quite a lot of data. Um, and if I was making one rest call for every single edge that I was creating, that would have take, taken a really long time. Um, the rest API does provide a batch function to help you batch process those. Um, I'll, I'll let you look at the source code to see exactly how that's working, but it is essentially just only executing those once every like thousand calls, and then it takes a batch and just does them all at once. That's just a performance thing. Um, but anyway, so so scraped down all of Ruby gems into gems, and then made that dependency graph out of that. So I want to look at how uh, Neo4j could let you poke around with that. So I have the gem. Um, so here, I'm not using Active Node or anything. I'm just writing queries directly um, using this. I'm, I'm only using kind of one kind of query, which is node names. So this will make a raw query against Neo4j, grab me back the results, and pluck out of that the name that's inside the data inside that JSON response. So just, just using the, the REST API more or less directly. Um, well, directly meaning through the Neography gem instead of something like Active Node. Um, so probably a really simple one is, like I, I know immediately by looking at the spec for this gem that it depends on active model and active support and ARL. But those depend on things that in turn depend on things and tracing that all the way out, uh, I think you can see how that's like the last problem would be kind of complicated to do. But pretty easy here. 
because I'm just going to match gems that start from my starting gem found by name and find anything that depends following any number of depends links all the way down. Um, so find the entire list of transitive dependencies. Uh, I did limit these because some of these ended up being a massive amount of data that took a long time. Um, but that's, that is just to make sure that they return. Um, so here are 25, the, and that's, so that's the, like active record doesn't depend on a whole lot. Um, but like active model, active support, and ARL were there. But then I guess active model depends on builder, active support probably depends on I18N and JSON and mini test. So yeah, active record does depend on JSON. It's good. Um, what's interesting is it, it's, it becomes really easy to go the other way. Like if I broke active record, um, I could get a list of everybody who would be mad at me, which would be a lot of people. Um, so I could do like G dependence, and that is, it's literally just the other thing. I'm gonna start with the gem named the name that I pass in, and find things that if I followed any number of dependency links, so here the, the ordering is very much important. In the user example it wasn't, but it's very easy to express. I just add an arrow on the link, and now it's just directional dependencies. So anything that depends on active record, anything that depends on things that depend on active records, and so on down. Um, so there are 25 things that depend on active records. As you can guess from the ordering and the fact that they all start with A's, there's probably a lot more. Probably a whole lot more. That's gonna start getting slow. So I'll skip that. Um, but yeah, so you, you could trace that out. Um, and realistically, you probably wanna limit that to like 10 steps or something, otherwise you're gonna get some bad performance. Um, similar sort of question, like you can ask what are the most important Ruby gems, and by that I mean what gems do a whole lot of people depend on. Um, this is a particularly expensive, so what this has to do then is you grab gems N, look at the, all of the gems C that depend on that gem N in any way, and return the count of those, and order by the things that have the highest count. Um, this is one of those, that, like, I, I don't feel like that looks that different from the other ones, but it turns out that takes a really, really long time to run. And, and I mean, maybe that's, maybe that's obvious to you, but, um, hmm. yeah, because I, I don't think Neo4j can be any more clever than literally doing this operation for every base gem N in which case you have to trace all of the transitive dependencies all the way back for every gem in the database. Yeah. So, yeah, it would have to be fairly clever to get around that, and I, I don't think it is. And really, like, it's gotta find all of them before it can, oh, I'm sorry, that's a class method. Um, since it's got a sword at the end, it's got to find all of them and can't be clever about taking top lists. So yeah, I have not actually finished running that one out ever. Um, I would like to do that, and that I think like uh, 88,046 nodes. Oh, more than that, because there's authors. Big. Um, yeah, graph problems about degree can be. So yeah, but that, so I'll point out like warning, these are the sorts of problems that as you start exploring graph databases, and especially if you tr start trying to scale them, um, you can run across something that I think looks pretty innocuous, but performs very badly. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to think about. Um, so, warning on that part. Uh, the things that it does really well, though, are, are these sorts of local graph questions. You have a node and you want to know what's two steps out from that, three steps out from that. That, that I really think, is, is wheelhouse stuff for, for any graph database, Neo4j, definitely. Um, I will say if you wanted to do this sort of thing, and I, like, I wanted to do a random walk demo on this graph, because I think that would be interesting, like where do you end up in the RubyGem ecosystem? Um, but in trying to write that out, it became really, like was running into tractability problems. Like, and, and also, because doing a random walk would mean making a rest call for every step, like that was just a lot of overhead. So I think the right way to do this is you want to hook in, like th there are a lot of tools for writing your own Neo4j plugins in Java. And if, like, if you're on JRuby, you can hook in a lot better. Um, so like, that would be the right approach to a more difficult problem like this one, like a random walk. Um, that's out of scope for this talk, but I wouldn't mind doing it later. Uh, 
So, but yeah, for, for now, just you know, be aware. Sometimes hard to reason about performance there. Um, right, and then last function that I wanted to mention here uh, is a people to ask for money helper. So can you guys parse that out? What's that looking for? Yeah. Who's using gems? I mean, who, who, who wrote gems that depend on gems that I wrote? Because I feel like they owe me, right? Um, I really wish that I had published gems so I could do me here and it make any kind of sense, and I didn't. Uh, so sorry for not contributing to the community. Um, but for instance, uh, if you have someone like DHH, oh, spec, sorry, spec, that I'm not gonna try and spell, I'm gonna copy. Um, if you had someone like DHH, I imagine some folks owe him some money. So yeah, that should be getting, start with DHH, look for gems that he wrote, look for gems that depend on those, and look for authors that wrote gems that depend on those, and give me back 25 of them. Oh, and I may have hung Neo for J and trying to kill all of this. Uh, yeah, let me restart that. Oh, good. Okay, so there's 10 people that wrote gems that depend on things that David uh, DHH wrote. I didn't pronounce that. Um, oh, yeah, what's going on there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, probably he can call himself square, but, eh. but yeah. Um, so yeah, like these sorts of queries, quite natural to express in Neo4j, hard in SQL. So if you find yourself running across those sorts of things, I would encourage you to look into a graph database. If you're interested in this sort of thing, play around. Uh, Neo4j, you know, pretty easy to get up and running. And honestly, like that, that web console has some great tutorials, some great like extra documentation on the REST API and it's really just a nice little sandbox to play around and try some examples out to see how they work. So I would definitely recommend that as a starting point if you want to learn more. Um, I think that's it for code examples for me. Questions? So you talked about like inferring and graph the web as examples. Yeah. How do you, uh, like, implement that scale as a graph, like tracing graph? Yeah, so it, it's really interesting. Um, again, some really good math there. Um, what can I say about that? There are, um, and I think like the, the main key idea there is you want to start thinking about uh, your graph nodes as elements in a vector, and the whole like moving from this point to this point becomes a matrix, and it ultimately boils down to a question of how do you compose a matrix with itself really fast, and so that's some like that's some linear algebra that's well studied linear algebra. Um, and that, in fact, is, I think, why Google pushed really heavily on MapReduce is because that problem is, like, the textbook example of a problem that's MapReducible. Um, so, yeah, look, there's some linear algebra stuff to look into. Uh, MapReduce is definitely big in that area. Um, and you can get some explicit solutions and not have to do the whole, like, you don't, you don't actually simulate out trying to randomly wander around a graph, you can compute exactly. I mean, at their scale, I'm sure they have other optimizations that I know nothing about, but like that's, that's the core idea there, is there's some linear algebra to do and some map reducing to compute it. Um, I can point you at some papers. There's good stuff. Yeah. Sure, yeah, oh, then that's not an example I've talked about. Um, so a really common sort of thing, especially if you're thinking of like nodes as cities, um, you can think of the links as being roads and they have numbers that are like the distance between them. And maybe you want to find a path that visits all of them with some, like that's a classic problem. Um, so yeah, the, you can add, and I guess we haven't seen that example. Like we've seen labels on arcs, but oh no we did. Uh, so remember in the first movie example um, we had Keanu was in the matrix, and on that node, we had role was, uh, was Neo. Um, so you can, on your edges in Neo4j, you can add any set of attributes there, including weight, that's a number. I mean, the, the, I'm not, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I'm not aware of a native notion of weight, but you are free to add whatever, I mean, it's schema-less, so you can add 
any attribute that means whatever to your application to any node or arc anywhere in the data set. So feel free to, to write your own. Um, but yeah, I get none of the algorithms that are built in that I'm aware of are aware of await. So yeah, I, oh. Yeah, I don't know that you could easily get a weighted shortest path without like having to write some Java yourself. Yeah, yeah. Although I don't believe the direction should impact query performance ever. Not Tom Brown. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I really like. You should ask the insightful folks that they'll know better than I will. Um, like the Twitter firehose in Neo4j is going to fall over. Like Twitter has written their own graph databases that are ruthlessly optimized for the exact queries that they need to run. Um, so like at that scale, I mean at that scale, you custom write anything anyways. No, I don't uh, think but, so, but like for nodes of this one, like take that. Yeah, if you like, if you want to take a slice of that, like you have some set of clients and you're looking at the local graph around their friends, I feel like this is a great tool to get started for something like that. Like you have a very rich query language, um, you can express lots of stuff. Um, you know, performance scalability questions aside, and th that may be difficult to scale later on, but yeah, I think that's a, a great place to get started for sure. Other questions? Okay, uh, so like I said, I'm gonna solicit some feedback here. There's a tweet that's that I actually kind of like, um, and I, I, I wanted to steal the JavaScript group, like a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle, um, but that's theirs already, and I can't do that. Um, but yeah, seriously, like, I, I am more than happy to talk about math at you all the time, because I like that, but I would love to see other people give talks and suggest things they're interested in. Um, you know, seriously, like, the, the best way to learn this stuff is to commit yourself to having to present it to other people, and that will motivate you to actually do some research. Um, so, yeah, if, if, they, if anyone wants to get involved with this stuff in any capacity whatsoever, please talk to me. Um, I would definitely like to hear your suggestions. Um, specifically, I'll, like, all of this, the slides, the Rails project are all up. Ping me on Twitter if you need anything. Um, but I did especially want to draw people's attention to a oh, wonderful. <laughs> Come on. So later tonight, if you go, <laughs> seriously? Uh, if you go to airtracker.herokuapp.com, um, and I'll put that link on the meetup, um, that will be a list. It's a little bit about this group. Um, I'll probably post some links to videos when they're up. Um, but the main thing is there's a list of topics that people have asked for or suggested. Um, you can like, log in and just vote, like, hey, I'd be interested in hearing this. Like, please post your own. Um, we're just going to take a straw poll on what people want to hear about, and that'll, that'll help do some planning about you know, what we talk about next time. Um, yeah, so check that out later. <laughs> Computers, man. Um, OK, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.